The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. If it's tennis, swimming, Pac-12 football, the Olympics, or the San Francisco 49ers, the voice you hear is that of Ted Robinson. And he's here with us. The game is sports. The game is on. Hi, I'm Kevin Mullen. And I'm Mark Simon. Welcome to the game. When he's not doing every other major sport, Ted Robinson is the radio voice of the San Francisco 49ers, a team that seems on the verge of a resurgence as the start of the NFL season is just around the corner. We are uh, happy to welcome back our friend Ted Robinson. Thank you for being with us. Well, it's great to be back in familiar surroundings, Kevin and Mark. And it's, uh, yeah, it's nice to come back when there's a chance to smile about the 49ers. We haven't had enough of those in the last few years. Yeah. It seems to me there's almost a cautionary note. When you go 6-0 and at the end of the season, that's mm -hmm. pretty exciting. But it's the end of the season, and, and a lot of reasons why you may not be getting everybody's 110% best effort. Still, how good do you think they can be? Well, I think that's the, the balance that the 49ers internally have dealt with since January of this year was understanding, hey, you know, we finished the year very well. But we kind of caught people by surprise. There was no book on Jimmy Garoppolo when he came in. Everybody gets that. It's, it's very similar to the guy that gets called up in September by the Giants and hits 380. And there's an old baseball axiom. You never judge somebody just by September. So it's the same thing here in football. But I would say uh, two quick things. One is the 49ers were 0-9 last year. And they had been beaten down for a couple of years in a row. And the fact that they did come back to win six of their last seven games speaks a lot to what John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan achieved inside. They rebuilt the internal chemistry. They rebuilt the locker room. And that team didn't crumble at 0-9, which is a rarity. Second part is this year, now there's going to be a bullseye on their back. Not as big as the Rams. The Rams are going to have the big one. But the 49ers are going to have a little bit of a target on their back for the first time in a few years. And people have spent the offseason watching the five games of Garoppolo saying, I think this is what we should do against them. So that will be the early season, one of the early season tests. Yeah. It is a little bit of a gamble, though. Such a big contract for just really six games in the bank. He must exhibit certain things, regardless of the book, once the defenses adjust to him. He must exhibit certain things that are really telltale signs that this guy is special, this guy's different than your garden variety quarterback. Yeah, Kevin, it was amazing because he walked in the building late October last year. He didn't know soul. He'd never been around a player on the team. He'd never been around a coach on the team, let alone the trainers, the medical staff, the strength people. He knew no one. And by January 1st, he had everybody. And I think he sort of hinted this. Kyle Shanahan was probably the last guy to jump on the wagon. And I think most football fans understand Kyle has a tremendous fondness for Kirk Cousins, who was a pending free agent. And that, I think, had been the the unspoken plan of attack all year for the 49ers. We're going to get through 2017, and then we're going to go out and just give Kirk Cousins what he needs and have him come here. Well, Garoppolo's play and the chemistry he developed with the team and, I think, as importantly, the fans. And I, I called this on the air. It was amazing. Uh, the 49ers beat Tennessee here in December. I think it was the third of the five games to end the season. And Robbie Gold kicked a field goal on the last play to win the game. So it's December 18th or something like that. And, again, the 49ers have been down for a few years now. And as Robbie Gold's kick goes through the uprights, the camera angle from the other end zone, as it always is, showing the kick, the stands are full. Mm. And people are throwing their arms up in the air to signal a good field goal for a team that at the time I think was 3-10. and 10. I hadn't seen that before. We hadn't seen that at Levi Stadium for sure. And that was, to me, the first sign that Garoppolo was grabbing everybody and bringing them into his orbit. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's interesting because there were so many criticisms of Levi Stadium. It'll be interesting to see how those fade away as the team gets better. Because mm -hmm. one of the problems uh, in the early years was that every seat you had a clear view of the field. So that always created a problem because you could watch what the 49ers weren't doing. <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing I've noticed is that as they get closer to having to start cutting people, um, I think I heard John Lynch say they're cutting people 
who can still play in the NFL. Mm -hmm. They used to cut people who went back to whatever it is they were doing, but it wasn't playing NFL football. So what does that say about the whole team having sort of been lifted up, that it's just a better team than it was mm -hmm. a better organization? Yeah, Mark, Mark I, that, that I, and this is my 10th year, and this, I think, is the third time I've heard that <laughs> phrase. And it, it's legitimate, but I think it speaks to that things in football are cyclical. And if you're the 49ers in the dynasty years or you're the Patriots right now, probably the Pittsburgh Steelers, you're exceptions to this. But at every point, the cycle spins, and at some point, your talent level dips, and suddenly you, you have people in your camp, let's say, out of the 90 you may look and say 20 of them really aren't NFL players. And that's last summer's camp for the 49ers. The roster was down. The talent level needed to be replenished. And going back to my locker room conversation, the, the, the kind of person that the 49ers were bringing in needed to change. So Lynch and Shanahan did that in last year's training camp. There were guys, Kyle has said it, there were guys that probably, not probably, they just weren't NFL players. Uh, I don't think... When I've looked at camp this year, I don't think I see that. And, for example, wide receiver is a position where the 49ers don't have a superstar wide receiver, but they probably have eight or nine guys that can play in the league. They won't be able to keep them all. So that's a spot where they may cut two guys who do get picked up by other teams. It's, it's a small sign, but I think it's somewhat significant when you're in the ramp-up process to let people know, okay, we have, we have guys here that can play. The 49ers have that. So just since you <clears throat> mentioned the Patriots, <clears throat> pardon me, you mentioned the Patriots, which triggered a question. I'm curious about your personal theory <laughs> on, with Tom Brady, uh, San Mateo County native, uh, yes. in, into his 40, early 40s now, why the Patriots would unload Garoppolo for what a second round pick, mm -hmm. I think it was. Was it internal dynamics in New England that resulted in that? What, what's the story behind the story <laughs> from your perspective on that? I've been wondering, like, did Bob Kraft give money to Sarah High School? Or, <laughs> or did Brady donate to Columbia where Bob Kraft went to college? I, I don't know. But trust me, I've asked the question uh, myself, and I can't get a straight answer, or I can't really get the answer more accurately. Uh, John Lynch has kept that incredibly close to the vest. Uh, so having said that, I think here's what we can see. So let's just apply things we know and internal in intuition and logic. You have an asset. If you're the New England Patriots, Jimmy Garoppolo's an asset in a quarterback-driven league and in a league that's thirsting for quarterbacks as the 49ers have been for the last few years. You have an asset. You decide to divest yourself of that asset. You try to max the return. There is not a single breathing football person that would suggest the, the Patriots maxed their return right. for that asset. Why? That's the, that's the lingering question. And honestly, I've got to the point where I no longer care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, you know, Patriot fans care, and I get that question, Kevin, a lot from people who still love the Patriots. What were they thinking? I don't care anymore. The guy's here, and because this league is driven by quarterbacks and because the 49ers were desperate for one, hence the contract, that means he's our guy. And I think that was important. I really... And I know there are still people who analyze and salary cap issues and contract sizes. I, I did that a lot in my baseball years. I don't do that in football because there is a very firm salary cap. In football, it doesn't have the crazy, you know, crater exceptions that the NBA has. NFL's pretty serious. So when you pay somebody, you give them 25% of the pie, there isn't any extra pie. <laughs> the other rest of the team has to slice up that 75%. You do that when you are sending a message to your team and to your fans. Hey, for better or for worse, this is where we're heading. And that's what they did with Garoppolo. So the key is don't look a gift patriot in the mouth. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage.
Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. Over here we have the man for all seasons, Ted Robinson. Uh, we were just talking a little bit about the NFL and specifically about the 49ers, but the NFL starts this season with so many controversies. The whole controversy over concussions, the controversy, controversy over kneeling during the national anthem. Um, fewer fans seem to be watching, although legalizing sports betting may change that in, in <laughs> the United States. Yeah. But um, is the NFL in trouble, at least in terms of where it used to be? I mean, it's still the number one sport. Yeah, you know, trouble is is the is the word mark that I hear a lot. I wouldn't suggest the NFL's in trouble. There's definitely concerns. Um, you know, all right, so let, let me riff a few of them very quickly here. So let's just start with the viewership thing you mentioned. By far and away, the most watched television programs in America every year are NFL games. They, I mean, it's, it's quite, if I were in one of the other sports and I worked a lot of years, 20 plus in baseball, I would be embarrassed and really concerned if I were in baseball where my viewership is aging, my demo is seriously graying, and the best watched baseball game every year doesn't even come close to the top 30 football games. Now, we're in a cord cutting era, so yeah, is there probably some slip in the NFL? Yes. Much more of a concern to me is stadium attendance. We've seen it at Levi's. If your team isn't winning and you don't give fans a compelling reason to come to the stadium, do they? And this is not a surprise. The NFL's been, the 49ers dealt with this when they were building Levi Stadium. They understood that challenge. That to me is still very much a part of it. Uh, the safety and health issue isn't going away. And I think the kickoff, for example, which is being dramatically reduced in the NFL this year, will be gone. I think it's a function of when, not if. Um, at some point, you cannot legislate risk out of the game. And I was talking to some of the 49ers top executives about this, and I said the same thing in the meeting. You said, you can't have a NASCAR race eliminating the risk of crashes. You, know, you can make everything safer for the drivers, right? The cars can be safer, helmets can be safer, the carriage and the chair and the seat can be safer. But at some point, there's the chance of a crash. Well, it's, football's the same issue. We can make everything as safe as we possibly can, but there will always be risk. And, and then the last part to me is the anthem. Thing, which has clearly gravitated and, and morphed into a big thing. And I think one part of the anthem issue that is lost, <clears throat> and I don't think the NFL has handled it very well personally as an entity, but what's been very lost is that it's wildly different in the 32 cities. And I lived this two years ago traveling the Colin Kaepernick circus, so to speak. Mm -hmm. In some places we went, it was an intensely vicious, violent reaction. Other places, Obviously, here it wasn't bad. Seattle, it wasn't bad. So each of the 32 cities, I think, has to deal with that issue as it relates to their locale and their customers. Um, there are certain cities I know that couldn't even touch Kaepernick because the customer base would revolt. Mm -hmm. There are others like here. It was never a problem here. That issue was never an issue here. So to lump all the 32 under one umbrella, which gets done very easily in our world today, doesn't it's not fair in addressing that problem. So what is your assessment of Roger Goodell, the commissioner? Um, powerful, pretty powerful commissioner, uh, although we've had some pretty powerful ones in the past, right? But how has he handled these controversies? He's the son of a U.S. senator. Yeah. He's a, kind of a political guy. Uh, I guess a darling of some of the owners, from what I can gather, just on the revenue side, he mm -hmm. plays a role there. But how has he dealt with these really like white hot controversies uh, that have uh, that have hit the league? What's yeah. your what's your assessment? You know, Kevin, that that's fascinating uh, topic, and we could probably spend 45 minutes here bouncing that one around. So let me condense again. Um, uh, Roger Goodell, I knew Bud Selig decently when Bud was the commissioner of baseball, and I liked Bud a great deal. And I knew Bud cared dramatically about the game. Bud was a political commissioner. He understood who he was working for. He was one of them. He was an owner. He was working for owners. He made sure that he really dealt with a consensus of owners. Goodell is not an owner, but I think Goodell operates the NFL the same way. I watch from the outside, and I do not know Roger Goodell, but I watch from the outside and I see him operating the NFL the very same way. The contrast is Adam Silver. And Adam Silver, since he took over the NBA, the first thing he did was reach out to the prominent players in the league. He went to them and sat with them. And I think the most important trait, listened. And as a result, 
here's the question. I've, I've started to ask this question internally where I work at the 49ers, and I think it's the one that should be discussed on a big level right now. We have two professional sports leagues where the predominance of the players are African-American, and in one, the per, there is a high percentage of fans that are African-American. Why does the NBA have no anthem problem and the NFL does? The NBA not only is the predominantly African-American players, but a, as we see when we go to Warrior Games, an incredibly racially diverse crowd. The NFL doesn't quite have that. Mm -hmm. The NBA, yet there's no anthem problem in the NBA. So if I'm in the NFL, that's a question I'm asking, and I want some, and I don't have an answer for it, but I'd like to find out. Give me some theories, give me some ideas as to why that is. Well, one of them is that the NBA is considered a player's league more than any other mm -hmm. sport. So maybe that's part of it, is if you, you know, if you lose, your name marquee player on an NBA team, you've got, you've got real problems with your fans mm -hmm. versus almost any other sport where it, you know, it depends on who it is, it depends on the sport, but if it wasn't Garoppolo, somebody else would be playing quarterback. I mean, there, I, I would think that's one of the significant differences. Yeah, and yet in the NBA, we have a league where the, the man sitting at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue right now has taken on foot, the football protesters, the players that are choosing to protest. He's taken them on head on. Well, he's done the same now with one of the greatest, if not the greatest player to ever play the game, <laughs> attacking LeBron James and attacking his intel. I mean, he's gone square at. Yet, if we don't see NBA players kneeling or raising the clenched fist for whatever reason during an anthem this October when the league starts up again, that's my, my question is, how has the NBA handled this mm -hmm. and kept the players and allowing the players to feel like they still have a voice? How is this happening? And the NFL is being, in some cases, divided by this very same issue. We're going to take a break. Mm -hmm. Stick around. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. And over here, the voice of the San Francisco 49ers, Ted Robinson. Uh, as is usually the case, we have so much to ask you <laughs> and so little time. We're going to try and move through a bunch of these things quickly. You do Pac-12 football. Mm -hmm. It looks like a conference that's really back, that it is, is back and ready to compete on the national stage. A lot of good teams, including, of course, Stanford. Yeah, I, well, I hope that's the case, Mark, because it was a rougher year last year. There was so much hope with two quarterbacks in Los Angeles, Josh Rosen and Sam Darnold. You'd, you'd have a Heisman Trophy winner out of it and teams contending for the national championship. Neither happened last year, and that was unfortunate. Uh, this year, I think USC is still USC. Washington is the team to beat, but two dark horses for me, Arizona coming out of the south with Khalil Tate, who has a chance to be a Heisman in the Heisman mix, and Oregon. Oregon's been down, but Oregon has a very talented quarterback who, if he's healthy, this is his third year, Justin Herbert. They, I think, you know, that, that home field and those fans are still so passionate in Eugene. That's another team I wouldn't sleep on. Yeah. And then in Stanford, we have Bryce Love, who is yeah. considered the, the, the preseason favorite for the Heisman. What's your take on Stanford? Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful because the, the, you know, Stanford had a quarterback change in the middle last year, and then K.J. Costello didn't play in the spring because of a hip injury. So I'm hopeful that that doesn't cost him or Stanford. Hopefully that David Shaw can have Costello's development. But, the, yeah, the fact they have the best game breaker in college football, and that's what Bryce Love proved to be last year. The best big play threat is outstanding. The one thing, if you're a real Stanford football fan, their defensive front wasn't quite as stout last year as it has been in David's era there. If that improves a little bit, that will help Stanford, and they'll need that, I think, especially to compete when they play Washington. K.J. Costello, he's a pro-style quarterback. Mm -hmm. I mean, is he a pro-caliber kind of a talent? Yeah, you know, Kevin, I, I don't open know. Open question, I guess. Yeah, well, that's, you know, those are the ones that the scouts will 
sit there and dissect yeah. with more intelligence than I would. I haven't seen him enough yet, to, quite honestly, to give you that answer. I do know that the, the NFL loves the kind of football that Stanford plays, the style of football they play. Um, that's why so many offensive linemen have been drafted from Stanford. Tight ends have been drafted from Stanford. Uh, so as the game changes, as high school and college football continues to evolve into spreading the field sideways and just throwing the ball around and pitching it, uh, Stanford, and there are a few schools like this, Wisconsin is another one, continue, they're anomalies. And they continue to play, <laughs> okay, traditional football. <laughs> And the NFL likes that because there's still the foundation of the NFL game is still rooted the way Stanford plays. What is, Go ahead. What is the state of college football? I mean, we were talking off the air about what's going on at Ohio State. Uh, it seems as though um, there's virtually nothing that a, a high-profile winning coach can do yeah. that isn't, that isn't going to allow him to stay in place. So two very quick things. One for college football to me, I am passionate about this, is they need to continue to address the same thing I referenced with the NFL, fans coming to the stadium. The beauty of college football is it's an emotional purchase. You support college football from here, your heart, as opposed to pro, which comes from your head. But four-hour games with 24-minute half times and then the, the rotating, you know, kickoff times and not knowing kickoff times until 12 days before is devastating. If I were the commissioner and I respect Larry Scott tremendously, whenever the next contract comes up, that has to go. So that's all TV scheduling. That's all television. That has to go. I don't it's all care. Money. It, of course. And I understand there's going to be a cost to that, but it is devastating to your in-person experience. And out here in our part of the world where the passion doesn't run as deep as it does in the SEC that cripples us. Auburn and Mississippi State, I use this all the time, Auburn plays Mississippi State at Auburn and the kickoff's 3 a.m. 75,000 people will be in the stadium. Stanford and Cal play the big game and kick off at 3 a.m. There'll be 750 people in the stadium. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about the national football playoff? Is, is it proceeding appropriately? Is there always going to be controversy, or should they make yes. it bigger? Should, they, should it be a bigger tournament? I don't think it will get bigger. I don't think it will get bigger in our lifetime. Um, it's proceeding. It, it isn't going to change. Uh, last year, to me, was was tough because I respect some of the people on the committee, but there is no way on God's green earth you can tell me that the college football regular season matters and Alabama gets into the playoff. You just can't have it both ways. You tell me you're supposed to pick the four best teams, okay, I get that. But then don't tell me the regular season matters when Alabama doesn't even win its own division, yet they're in the college football playoff. That's just nonsense to me. So. I, I sadly don't think it'll change because, again, the schools, it's business. We have the game coming here this year. The mm -hmm. game's going to be at Levi Stadium in January. And quite honestly, it'll be fabulous to have a Washington or an Oregon, Stanford, of course, although quite honestly, the business demands schools from the outside that come in and bring fans, that book hotel rooms, that come in and patronize restaurants and local things. So. You need Alabama, you need Georgia, you need Oklahoma, you need Michigan, you need Ohio State, whatever, Penn State, Nebraska, the great Texas, the great traditional powers who will travel 20,000 fans to the game. That's what you need to make the playoff make sense. I believe University of Notre Dame has that reputation as yeah, well. I know, I didn't, I didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, real quickly, you did um, recently did the U.S. Swimming Nationals. Mm -hmm. um, just your quick take on the U.S. Uh, swimming team as we, as, as we sort of ramp up to the Olympics. Yeah, it's fabulous. Look, swimming is Michael Phelps and others. Michael's been the lead to it. But Michael Phelps and a host of other incredibly gifted swimmers have built something now that isn't going to go away. The pipeline is strong. We don't have a Michael Phelps. We probably never will. That's not odd. Uh, we have Katie Ledecky, who is the greatest female swimmer I've ever seen. Uh, and shows no sign of letting up. She was preceded by Missy Franklin, who we thought was going to be that, and Missy came here to Cal, and unfortunately, her career is derailed, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uncertain as to whether she can ever come back. Katie shows no sign of that. And by the way, tremendous compliment to Stanford in that Katie Ledecky turned pro, but she's staying at Stanford in two ways. She's staying at Stanford to train for the next Olympics and to continue as a student. Mm -hmm. to get her degree. Mm -hmm. I think that's an incredible compliment. Um, we're jumping around a little bit. Yeah. Um, we talked about the state of college football. Um, generally, the state, of, the state of collegiate sports and this whole question of sex abuse, which just seems to be almost epidemic yeah. in some levels. Um, is that just the, the, the nature of relationships? I mean, is, and how do you clean that up? Well, it has to be. 
I mean, it, what we what we have all lived through in watching it. It was Penn State football X years ago, but this case with the gymnastics doctor who was based out of Michigan State is just is it's appalling and offensive and every you know one of those adjectives we can draw up, um, and it's de devastating. I'm I'm so thrilled that all of those young women have been given a form if they choose it, and many have chosen to speak up to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, other sports are dealing with it in smaller cases. In swimming, it has been dealt with at local levels where it's nothing to the, anywhere near the scale of the gymnastics doctor, but it's been local swim clubs and coaches more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that dynamic, absolutely, it just has to change. Um, unfortunately, it's going to cost a lot of people, it already has cost people. I know people at USA Swimming who've lost jobs over the thing and it's it's hard again we would need a half hour to go through it because it's some in some ways it's unfair to expect a national governing body to be able to oversee 8,000 or 10,000 little small swim clubs in other cases at some point it is a local issue and I'm gonna have to stop you there yeah. Ted Robinson thank you as always for being with us you bring me in here you understand you bring an announcer <laughs> yeah, in. no no <laughs> what happens? that's the problem is there's just too much to talk about I love it. Mark and Kevin time. thanks for having me again and I'm Mark Simon. And I'm Kevin Mullen. Thank you for being with us and join us next time on The Game.